Well, if you brought a Bible this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Acts. And our, our text is going to be in Acts chapter 5. That's where we'll be reading in just a few minutes. So you might want to go ahead and turn in that direction in your Bible. Acts chapter 5. You know, the past several weeks, I've been dealing with the subject of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit coming in power, the Holy Spirit coming in purity, the Holy Spirit coming in anointing, the Holy Spirit moving among us in gifts. This is something that I believe we definitely need in this 21st century. The Holy Spirit really is the difference maker. Jesus required that his disciples go and wait. Uh, for the Holy Spirit to come and empower them, anoint them, in order to uh, empower them to live like saints in a sinful world, uh, to live morally in a world that was a moral quagmire. In fact, we need the Holy Spirit no less today because the world we live in is sliding rapidly towards Sodom and Gomorrah. So this Holy Spirit is a holy spirit and emphasis on holy so that the Holy Spirit's work in us would keep and preserve us from falling uh, and following the way of the world and drowning in uh, filth and sin. Look, it has become the norm today. Immorality is now the norm and not the exception. So for a people to live above it uh, and to deny their flesh the instant gratification, especially in a world so ripe with temptation at every hand, so many allures, it's going to take the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We, we cannot neglect nor avoid the importance of it. And to live by faith in a world so hostile to faith, and becoming increasingly so is going to definitely take the work of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to fill us, to charge us, <laughs> to change us, uh, to revolutionize us. Amen. Amen. Uh, if we're going to live as victors instead of victims, then we need the Holy Spirit. Now, in Acts chapter 2, we've been studying the past few weeks, you know, Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was poured out. That's when the church was actually born, by the way. The church was given birth on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. And the church was born in Pentecostal power. It came in in power. It needed that Pentecostal power in order to spread its message throughout the world. The men and women who spread the message had to be men and women who were themselves transformed by Pentecostal power so that they had character and integrity because you can't pe preach a message of purity if you yourself are uh, uh, filthy and uh, and impure right none of us are perfect to be sure but how can we preach to others a message that has not transformed us how can we be confident it would transform and deliver somebody else if we ourselves are bound to the very sins that we're trying to see others delivered from. It has to work in us. Uh, you read through the book of Acts, and it's interesting to note that while there was one mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit, of course we see where others were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, the household of Cornelius, the Holy Spirit fell, filled them all with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 19, in, the, in uh, Ephesus, when Paul preached to the disciples there, the, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we saw that they spoke in tongues and prophesied. But it's also interesting that many times in the book of Acts, or at least several times, you'll see where the same group who were already baptized in the Holy Spirit were then filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible will say, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, if they were already baptized in the Holy Spirit, why would they need to be filled with the Spirit again? Uh, I, I like Brother Dave's answer. He said, because sometimes we leak. So... You know, I, I think that that, uh, that that might be a, a rather simple, but I like it. Because, uh, you know, you live in this wicked world. It, the wickedness of this world tends to poke holes in our spiritual plumbing, I think. And 
Uh, it, uh, there is a, a constant need for us to be filled with the Spirit of God. And we can do that by immersing ourselves in the Word, by drawing close to the Lord in prayer. You know, it's the simple things that we neglect that cause us to, draw, to grow stale and spiritually dull. Just the simple, basic things. Prayer. Be, with, be alone with the Lord. Open your Bible. Pray. Be in the church fellowship. Learn. Grow. Simple things that make a, a dramatic difference, right? Well, we pray, come Holy Spirit. We pray, Holy Spirit, fill us. Holy Spirit, sweep through us. Flood our souls. Holy Spirit, come with all of your power. Come with your anointing. Come and revive us. Come and change us. Come and transform us. Set our hearts ablaze. Come in all your Holy Spirit glory and all your Holy Spirit fire. But today, I want to mention that are you sure you're knowing what you're praying for? When you pray that way, come Holy Spirit in all your power, in all your glory, in all your anointing, and in all your fire. Remember John the Baptist said, Look, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me, he said, whose shoe latchet I'm not worthy to unloose. He said, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And when we pray for this baptism, this move of God, a real sweeping Holy Ghost revival, I'm not so sure that we really know what we're asking for. The Holy Ghost and fire. I want to preach today on the Holy Spirit that the church does not know. The Holy Spirit that the church does not know. And it's not the Holy Spirit that gives us an anointing to speak in tongues and prophesy. We know that Holy Spirit. Not that there's another Holy Spirit, but I don't believe that the church fully, fully reads, grasps, and comprehends who the Holy Spirit actually is. If we did, I don't think the church would be pulling all of the shenanigans that it does and that it has done at least for the last years or so. Now, that the events, I told you we were going to to go to Acts 5, uh, but I want you to look with me to Acts 4 first, because the, the events in Acts chapter 5 uh, occur in the context of what's going on in the previous chapters, chapter 4, 3, and 2. And uh, I would emphasize that these events take place shortly after Pentecost. So the church is is relatively new. Perhaps a year has passed by the time you get to Acts 5. Some, some chronologies have it as much as two years perhaps have passed. But we know the events of chapter 5 and chapter 4 are very shortly after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Now, in chapter 3 and chapter 4, sick people are being healed the crippled people are walking. Miracles are taking place. Uh, the apostles are not uh, in favor in the eyes of the Jews, the rabbis, the Pharisees, and so forth. Some of them were arrested. They were threatened for preaching in the name of Jesus. We're going to begin reading in verse 23 of Acts 4, where being let go because they had been arrested, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. So they went back to the church and, and were reporting what happened. And in verse 29, we'll skip down to there, it's, they're, they're praying. They're not whining. They're not saying, look, we're filled with the Holy Ghost. We're preaching the good word of God. We should be being blessed and prosperous, but instead we're finding persecution. Uh, we're finding opposition. People don't like us. They're arresting us. They're threatening us. So, Lord, make our enemies go away. 
No, this is what they pray. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Lord, just give us the courage we need to face whatever we're, we're facing. By stretching forth your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Don't we need this today? And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. So God hearkened to their prayer. The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now you notice verse 33, they had great power. Then later in verse 33, great grace. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is a very interesting passage. Uh, Great power, great grace, and this was all manifested then amongst themselves in the church with great charity and great generosity. You want to remember the church is experiencing unprecedented growth. Multitudes are being added to their number. And of the thousands who are coming in, being saved, I mean, they see the miracles, the signs, the wonders, lives transform, the deaf hear, the blind see, the, the, the lame walk. Thousands are coming in, and many, many, many of these people had needs. Many of them had real needs. Many of them had great needs. There was, at that time, no uh, government agency or social agency to address the needs of those who were hungry. Hello. You couldn't go to the local food bank. You couldn't apply for food stamps or other food assistance. You could not go to the housing authority and ask them for some housing assistance. There was no welfare, no unemployment. So the result was, in that time and in that age and in that society, you want to know that among the Jews, there were many beggars among the Jews. But among the church, the church, in the church family, there were no beggars. Because this great grace and great power had transformed them into men and women of great generosity and great concern one for another. So that, even so that, they did not live selfishly. They did not live self-absorbed lives. This is really not the beginning of communism, as some have said. Nor is it a great experiment in socialism or in communal living. You know, there are... a uh, a few groups today who still practice a communal lifestyle, most of those groups died off years ago, the old shakers and so forth, where they believe that according to these verses, no one person should own anything. Everything should be owned by the group, you know, so that we, uh, we all, like a kibbutz, I guess, we all live together, work together, uh, share together, eat a common meal together. That's, this is not an experiment in socialism. This is simply what it says, that there was great need, and when great need arose, the church rose to the occasion, and the Lord moved on their hearts, and they met the needs. They met the needs. That's what it amounts to. And look, this is a powerful thing when you realize that 
that these are all Jews, okay, who become who became Christians. The Jews to this day are notorious for their what? They can hold on to a dollar like nobody. For these people to be so transformed so that now those who were so tight-fisted, greedy, covetous... You know, remember, the Bible talks about the covetousness of the Pharisees. These people were transformed. Now what characterizes them is generosity and concern one for another and care, genuine care one for another. This is liberating, beloved. Let me tell you, it takes the Holy Ghost to transform a greedy person into a generous person. Amen. That's a fact. Because a greedy person is greedy all their life. Unless... Unless the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them. And brings in a deliverance... And, and one of the things that the Lord delivers us from is our self-absorption, our fears, our stinginess, so that, look, they gave. I've heard some really strange uh, comments, uh, interpretations, explanations of some of the things that went on here. I like, you know, I like the passage here where it says, and they brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. One pastor, whose name I will not mention, but he preaches that this means the apostles sat on an elevated platform and that the congregation brought up money and threw it up on the stage or stuffed it in the, in the apostles' pockets. And... He had this fella had a TV program, and when he would preach, you could sometimes see people walking up and throwing money on the stage. That's they were putting it at his feet. You see, uh, that was for the apostle, or they were bringing up money, and actually you could see a hand. He'd be preaching, you'd see a hand come up and stick money in his pocket. You know that, and that's how he interpreted uh, this passage. And there are many who who say, well, look, they were they brought it to the apostles' feet, so. The apostles sat up on a big throne and people came up and, and, and put money at their feet in, in homage, you know. Uh, actually, this is an, it's just a figure of speech. It's the same thing you see over in Acts chapter 7 when they stoned Stephen and the people who did it brought their cloaks and laid it at Paul's feet, who was then Saul of Tarsus, but they laid that at his feet. This was no act of homage. It's simply that he was the authority. He had been in charge. And he was the one who was actually overseeing uh, the stoning of Stephen. And it's the same way here. It's not that they're sitting on some elevated platform in a throne above everybody else. Paul says that he grew up at Gamaliel's feet. He was being instructed by him. That's the whole idea. Uh, they put the money at the disposal of the apostles so that they could disper dispense it to whoever had the need. That's the idea. Y'all follow? Yeah. When they brought money uh, to the apostles, it was not for the apostles to live a lavish lifestyle. Amen. It was not so that they could live like rock stars and, and, and like kings. Build palaces bigger than Herod's. Hello. I mean, I just thought I might mention that, you know. Uh, but, but do we see this transformation of, of people's lives as now they want to help those who have need? We also recognize from Acts chapter 5, which we, we're going to get there in a minute, <laughs> that none of this was imposed upon those who had money or who had lands. In other words, your giving was always voluntary. The giving of those who had was on a voluntary basis. They were not manipulated. They were not coerced. They were not forced. 
They were not looked down upon if they didn't do it. But those who had much were able to sacrifice in order to help those who had nothing. And remember the situation at the time. There were a lot of people who had a lot of needs. Nor should we get the idea that those who had plenty or those who were rich, that they gave everything away so that they were then poor. That's not what it says. But they were able to give, to give generously, to give sacrificially. As needs arose, the Lord always moves on people's hearts to help meet the needs. That's what we see. Uh, but no one was pressured. No one was required to give. Hello? But God moved on the hearts of the congregation. Now look, we're going to see something similar. Look back with me to Acts 2, just real quick. Acts 2, I want to read a couple of verses here, beginning in verse 41. You know, the point is that the church looked out for its own. The church looked out for its own. In verse 41, now this is the day of Pentecost. Pentecost fell. Peter preached his great message, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The promise is unto you and your children and all that are afar off, even as many the Lord our God shall call. Verse 41, he says, they that received his word were baptized the same day that was added to them about 3,000 souls. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. And fear came upon every soul. Now, in my Bible, I underline this. This is an important part of what the Holy Spirit does. When the Holy Spirit comes, he doesn't just come to sweep through us with tongues of fire. He doesn't just sweep through so that we can speak in tongues or prophesy or, 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 or be exuberant and jump and dance. And all of that is great. But I want you to see that with this mighty move of the Holy Ghost came fear. Now this is a sense of reverence that seized everyone. Fear came upon every soul. I wrote in the margin of my Bible here, a wholesome fear of God. Not all fear is bad, you know. There is a wholesome fear, a fear of God, a reverence for who He is. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, and they sold possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Again, this is not the... Uh, establishment of socialism or communism, but it's the influence of the Holy Spirit on a person's heart. The Holy Spirit liberates. The Holy Spirit makes us generous. Thank you. Amen. Yes, He does. The Holy Spirit makes He makes us generous. Praise God. And the generosity. Met the need. Praise God. Now, we uh, read over in chapter 4 about this generosity and how Barnabas brought up uh, some land and donated it. Remember we just read that over in Acts chapter 4, verse 36, 37. You know, he had some land. He sold it. He brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas is mentioned by name, while well, nobody else in these chapters are, chapter three, or 2 or 4. Maybe he's mentioned by name because Barnabas later became a, a major player uh, in the apostolic ministry, traveling extensively with the Apostle Paul. Maybe he's mentioned by name there uh, for that reason, that he's one who had land, extra land or additional land, or who made a gift of it to the church so that it could be dispersed to those who had need. 
And that's what brings us to chapter 5. And I would like you to turn there with me if you would. Because this is what was going on, right? We just read. Now remember, it's not written in chapter and verse. This is one flowing narrative. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, you know, literally her name is Sapphire, the gem, the gemstone, Sapphire, his wife, he sold a possession, or oh, they did, they sold a possession, just like Barnabas did, just like some of the others did. Verse 2 says they kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and they brought a certain part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You've not lied to men, but you've lied to God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. So Ananias now dies in the church. Remember, the account is... There were needs. Some sold lands or houses or whatever they, they could to help meet those needs. They did so willingly and voluntarily. They were not under no compulsion to do so. And if they sold something, they didn't have to bring all that they got for it. They could have brought a part of it. That's what uh, Peter tells him right here. He says to Ananias, look, while you had this, you had this land... It was in your power. You could have done with it what you wanted to. You could have sold it and kept all the money for yourself. That's not a sin. You could have sold it and gave half of it. Or gave a fourth of it. A tenth of it. That's not a sin. What was the sin was that they pretended that they were giving all of it. So the sin was in the lie, in the pretense, in the hypocrisy... And maybe, maybe some show was made of it. We don't really know. Some commentators suggest that, well, you know, Barnabas was getting some recognition. We saw that in chapter 4. He made this gift. Maybe Ananias wanted some recognition. Maybe he wanted praise or applause. Maybe he wanted an office in the church. Sometimes, you know, people think you can buy that. If you give big, they'll make you an officer in the church. Maybe put you on the board, give you some authority. Because you're a big giver, you, you're therefore qualified. We don't really know. What we do know is that there was sin in what they did. The sin was duplicity. The sin was in the lie. The sin was in the hypocrisy. The sin was in the pretense. Peter said, you could have done anything you wanted with this. It was your land. It was under your power. You were under no compulsion to bring it all. But to pretend that you brought it all, when in fact you brought only a portion, is to lie to the Holy Ghost. And he says, you're not lying to men, you're lying to God. And Ananias drops dead in the church. This is under grace. New Testament. Under grace. The Holy Spirit, when He comes in the fire of purity and power, we also have to see that the Holy Spirit comes in judgment. And that He sees... You're not going to hide anything from God. I mean, you might fool a, a person, but you're certainly not going to fool God. And when the Holy Spirit's presence is so real, so thick, and so powerful, you should have a holy fear. A holy fear. You don't come and spread lies. You don't come looking for self-exaltation. You don't come looking for the praise and admiration of men or think you can buy some spot in the, uh, in, the, in the church leadership. 
You certainly don't come with this pretense and hypocrisy. Here's what the Bible says. He gave up the ghost and great fear, verse 5, came on all them that heard these things. Great fear. The young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. That's the way they did things in those days. And it was about the space of three hours later when his wife, not knowing what was done, she came in. Now, what you find out is that the two of them conspired together here. It was some collaboration on their part. They had planned in advance what they were going to do. They were going to sell this piece of property. They were going to keep part of it for themselves and donate the rest to the, to the church. But they were going to pretend that they were giving it all to the church. That's the plan. We're in agreement. Let's do it. Verse 8, Peter answered and said unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yea, for so much. Now, it could be that if, you know, if Ananias had brought this contribution from selling the property, the contribution, the amount of money might have been sitting right there, visible, might have still been there. It's only been a couple hours. And so he said, Is this how much you sold the land for? Now, here's her chance. You can tell the truth. Did you sell it for that much? She said, Yep. That's, that's how much we sold it for. Right there. That's how much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you've agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and they'll carry you out too. And she fell down straight away at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young man came in and found her dead. And carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear, great fear, came upon all the church. And as many as heard these things, great fear. Interesting Greek term. Mega, mega, you know mega, gigantic, huge, enormous. Phobos, where we get our word phobia from. Phobia, you know, fear, fear of this, terror of that. It means fear. It means to be afraid. In fact, mega phobos, it means to be very afraid. Very afraid. So with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost came great fear. Now this is a wholesome fear of God. A holy awe. God is held in Holy reverence, not to be trifled with, not to be lied to, not to be lied about. You don't come and make your wild exaggerations, lies, pretenses, or hypocrisy. You see, that's why I'm saying I want to speak on the Holy Spirit the church doesn't know. Because today we trifle with God. And, and even in the pulpit. I'll tell you what, if God started smiting people for lying today... For pretense, for hypocrisy, for exaggeration, for lying. Well, I know fishermen would be in trouble for one thing, but, but probably not just the fishermen, probably golfers and maybe hunters. Or, but I'm even afraid for the preachers, to be honest with you. It's interesting what you can take away from a chapter like this or from a section like this. You could say, you see that? So if you made a vow to God, you better bring that vow or else. You should have a holy fear of not paying that vow. But let me tell you what I take away from it. Because you see, I see from a different perspective. And if people bring those offerings to God, you better have a holy fear of misusing that money. I can promise you those apostles had a holy fear of misusing what people brought. Not one of them thought, you know what? I could really use me a two-hump camel with some of this money. That's what I need. Let me take some of that. There was a holy fear amongst the congregation, but there was a holy fear amongst the apostles. Don't 
You better not touch anything. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Hello. That's what I'm saying. Where's the holy fear today? Where is the holy fear? I, I'm persuaded that this is an aspect of the Holy Spirit that is completely neglected. I, I hear people manipulate. I hear the most shameful manipulation to try to get money out of a congregation. I would be, af I would be afraid to say some of the things these people say. And it, it just illustrates to me a lack of a holy fear. The church has, in many cases, become uh, preachers, shameless merchandisers, shameless merchandisers, so that everything is a product to be hyped and sold. Uh, you would think that God calls us to go and sell instead of go and tell. Uh, one, one person told me not too long ago that they had gone to a conference and that before the star came out to speak, there was a 45-minute presentation, 45 minutes long, of all the products that they had available for you to sell. And the products, of course, was their ministry materials, you know. You need to know how to prosper. So for this box of tapes, you know, $90, you're going to learn how to prosper. <laughs> Listen, I realize, I, I do, I realize that materials cost. It costs us to produce things. It costs us, it, it costs. And I don't have a problem with somebody wanting to regain their cost. I really don't. But, but this shameless merchandising is a stain in the body of Christ. He didn't call any of us to go and sell. He called us to go and tell. To go and tell. And to make the gospel of no charge as much as possible. Now, if somebody's going to charge a, a, a reasonable amount for a book or a, a series of cassettes or whatever, I, I, there's no problem there, right? There's no problem there. But this shameless merchandising is heartbreaking. And I'm going to tell you, I think the fear of God is mightily lacking in the Pentecostal and Charismatic movements in particular. I believe that because we have somehow missed this aspect, this element of the Holy Spirit coming and producing a godly fear and reverence, it has caused so many people to play with sin, to play with the world, you know, I won't take the time, but I could break your heart because I did it this past week. Just this past week, I sat down with a pen and paper and began writing down the names of people that I know of or have heard of just in the last years that were very powerful leaders in the Pentecostal charismatic movement who fell due to sexual sin Multiple affairs, babies out of wedlock, uh, homosexuality. And if it wasn't these scandalous, horrible, scandalous sexual sins, then it was financial impropriety or, or some other sin of a scandalous nature. And I, I remember an old charismatic leader, many, he, not too many years ago, but this is what he said before he died. He said, you know... The Pentecostal movement has to be of God because otherwise our leaders would have destroyed it a long time ago. <laughs> he was commenting on the fact that so many of the Pentecostal and charismatic leaders have fallen into sin and degradation. Now why do you think that is? Do you think that there's a missing fear of God somewhere? Somehow that has not been transferred that's not been imparted so that people can manipulate and lie so that they can hype uh, so that they can merchandise and try to make merchandise even of the church so that they'll say the most outlandish things to get you to part with your money not long ago i heard one say that if you will give me a thousand dollars i'll get a thousand people saved 
Now I'll tell you what. That's a pretty cheap that's pretty cheap if you could if you could save a thousand for a thousand dollars. But I would be afraid to make a comment like that. I'd be very afraid to make a comment like that. Well, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes, He does come in fire. And that fire is a refining fire. It's a purifying fire. And the intent of the Holy Spirit is to produce holiness in us. And, and you know, if we had a genuine fear of God, a genuine Holy Ghost fear of God, what a difference that would make in our attitude towards the sins that tempt us. If we were afraid. A little fear, the right kind of fear, is a healthy thing. Afraid to compromise. Because look, there, the Holy Spirit, oh, He's very real. The signs, the wonders just created a powerful atmosphere of faith. They realized the power of God's Spirit. And then this demonstration of uh, people dropping dead. Hello? You don't think that would produce fear? Great fear. It produced great fear. And you know, this is not the only occasion in the Bible where something like this happened, even in the New Testament. You can read a little further over uh, in Acts chapter 12 where God smote Herod. Remember old, old, rich, affluent, proud, and cocky Herod? The Bible says, Acts 12, he made a great oration, a great speech, and he was arrayed in some fine clothing so that he shined brilliant like the sun. People saw him, they heard his brilliant speech, and they said, that's not the voice of a man, it's the voice of a God. And the Bible says, and the Lord smote him because he did not give God the glory. He did not give God the glory, so the Lord smote him. Can I remind you, this is New Testament. This is not Old Testament. This is New Testament. Grace. Under grace. Hello. Amen. Years ago I heard a, a preacher say, I wish I knew who said it, I'd give him credit for it, but uh, I don't know who it was, I've forgotten. But he said, he was preaching to a bunch of preachers and he said, look, there's three things you never do. He said, you don't touch the gold, you don't touch the glory, and you don't touch the girls. <laughs> and that was great advice to preachers, huh? Don't touch the gold. The money, the offerings, that's not for you. So you make sure that whatever is done financially in the church is scrupulously done. Don't you touch the gold. But... He also said, don't you touch the glory. Don't touch the glory. The Lord says, the glory is mine. I won't share it with another. He will not share it with another, nor will he give his praise to graven images, he said. So don't touch the glory. Don't, don't accept men's admiration and think that you really are something. Don't let, don't let that go to your head. Just remember, you're a vessel. Your feet stink like everybody else's. None of us are above others, that's for sure. You remember that. If you don't touch the glory, that you know what that would prevent you from doing? It would prevent you from this shameless self-promotion, self-exaltation, the wild exaggerations, sometimes the outright lies to draw attention to yourself. Some of the endless hype, if you didn't touch the glory... And if you don't touch the gold, not that it's wrong to be blessed, but don't you take what doesn't belong to you. Don't you take, don't you take from that. And definitely don't touch the girls. And nowadays you gotta add all the boys. <laughs> Sad but true. <laughs> You know, in Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas were preaching. And, and, and the, 
a lame man was healed who had been sick all his life. In fact, this fellow had never walked. And he was healed under their ministry. And the people were so awestruck that they wanted to offer sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. In fact, they said the gods are walking among us. This is Mercury and Jupiter. So they wanted, they were readying to offer sacrifice to them, you know, holding them in this kind of uh, esteem, glory, and admiration. And, and, and the Bible says they rent their clothes. The apostles did. They rent their clothes in great grief and concern and holy fear of God, <laughs> saying, look, don't do that. We're men just like you. We're men just like you. This is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not us. Uh, don't, don't you sacrifice to us. Uh, but I find it very interesting that this element of holy fear was one of the requirements for those who would be servants and, and officers and ministers in the early church. That... You know what the Lord looked for? Not men who were going to be popular, rich, prominent, eloquent, uh, talented. But in Acts, you still right there in Acts 5? Yeah. All right, let's look to another. Look with me to Acts 6. One, remember, this is just a big flowing narrative here. In, in Acts chapter 6, in those days, the number of the... Disciples was multiplied. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And the twelve, that is the twelve apostles, called the multitude of the disciples and said, Look, it's not reason that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you, seven men. This is what you're to look for, for leadership in the church. These would be the deacons. Now look, the deacons were servants. That's what they did. They were servants. However, they were also gifted, anointed men of God. Uh, you read about Philip. You read about Stephen. These were godly men, preachers, used mightily of the Holy Ghost. Here's what you look for. Rich men. Men with great talents. Choose out the best looking ones among you. Make sure that none of them chubby or, uh, you know, too skinny or, uh, you know, you gotta have the big, the best looking ones. That's not what they said. Here's what you look for. Look out among you. So you look amongst you, seven men of honest report. Honest report. What does that mean? Men of character. Men of integrity. That's what. Character means something. Character and integrity. That's what you look for. And, he says, so they have to be men of character, full of the Holy Ghost, and wisdom. Some good old sanctified common sense. Wisdom. Godly wisdom. Godly grace. But there's something else here in wisdom. Because what does the Bible say is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the foundation of all wisdom. That's what it means. So you can be smart and have no wisdom. You can be educated and have no fear of God, and therefore you are not a very wise person. Because if you were wise, you would hold God in holy reverence. Implicit here is that these were men full of the Holy Ghost and a holy reverence, a holy fear of God. These are the people you want in charge of handling the ministrations. It means that they would be in charge of money, of disbursements, of taking care of needs. You want people full of the Holy Ghost for that. And wisdom. Wisdom that, according to the Bible, the fear of the Lord. Because if you have a holy fear of God, you're not going to embezzle money that's not yours. You would be afraid. You're not going to tell lies. No, we don't have anything to help you with. Uh, but you know, you'll help somebody else whose skin is of a, the, the color that you prefer. Uh, the fear of the Lord. Lacking in the church today. He says, we will appoint these men. 
over this business. Lord, give us this Holy Ghost, this wisdom, this holy reverence, this fear of the Lord. Look, Job chapter 28 and verse 28. Listen to this. Job said, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. The fear of the Lord, that's wisdom. And to depart, to depart from evil, that is understanding. <laughs> you don't run to evil, you run from it. Praise God. Then you've got, you know what, one last account. Look with me over to Acts chapter 13, since you're right here. Acts 13, might as well mention this one as well. Paul and Barnabas are going to Barnabas' hometown. He's from Cyprus. Verse 4, they were sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia, departed unto Seleucia. From there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, the capital city, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They had John there to their minister. This is John Mark, by the way, who later would write the Gospel of Mark. And when they had gone through the isle unto Patmos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, son of Jesus, son of Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now, he's a prudent man. This is a guy with some common sense, a decent man, uh, a wise governor of the land. He said, I want to hear these guys. I want to hear them preach. I want to hear what they have to say. He didn't persecute him. He wanted to hear him. But notice verse 8. Elymas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them. He opposed them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost, he set his eyes on him, and he said, Whew. He said, You know, Elymas, with a big smile, God loves you. And wants a wonder, he has a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> Not mentioning any names, but he said, you full of all subtlety and all mischief, you child of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? The implication here is that this fellow had been opposing Paul and Barnabas, you know, as long as they had been there. He had been, whatever he was up to, cunning, crafty, Opposition, Paul says, Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. Now we want the hand of the Lord upon us. Except for like this. <laughs> we definitely don't want this. And thou shalt be blind. Not seeing the sun. But notice this. Here is even mercy in the midst of judgment. For a season. He wouldn't be permanently blind, but he would be struck blind for a period of time. He said, and immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now look, this is grace. New Testament, Holy Ghost. That's why I mentioned earlier, are we sure we really want the Lord to move in power? Move in power, move in glory, come with all of your anointing. Because remember, the Holy Ghost also comes with fire. And while the fire certainly represents the persecutions that the church often went through, certainly it can represent that. Certainly it can represent the trials, afflictions, adversities. 
like one fellow said, you know, they were saying, well, what is the real evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit? And the argument was gone. You know, speaking in tongues is the real evidence. And this said, no, holiness is the real evidence. And one fellow piped up. He said, the real evidence of the Holy Ghost? Trouble. <laughs> because if you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, your life is so dramatically different than you were before. And it just makes waves everywhere you go. Not that you intentionally stir up trouble. It just seems to follow you. <laughs> Praise God. Look, this is the Holy Spirit moving in a way that we often don't like to think of. The Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, by the way. Look, not the work of Paul. Paul wasn't just mad and pronouncing a curse. This is the Holy Ghost speaking through him, bringing judgment on this man. The Holy Spirit comes in judgment. That's the Holy Spirit the church in America does not know. The Holy Spirit that comes in judgment. In Acts chapter 5, to cleanse and purify his people, to cleanse his church, to put a holy fear and reverence of God in their midst. In Acts chapter 12, in smiting Herod for stealing glory that belongs to God alone, that he will not share. Don't you exalt and think that you are something or somebody. None of us are anybody apart from the grace of God. We, like Paul, tear our garment. Don't sacrifice to me, God forbid. Look what God did to Herod for taking glory that God says he won't share. And this judgment upon those who oppose the work of God. This is something that God can sovereignly do. We don't independently call down judgment on others. We, we pray for people. We do pray. We pray that God would smite their heart and their conscience and deliver them and change them. But when the Holy Ghost comes and He comes in power and anointing, this is also possible, just as we see it right here. The Lord heals. But let me tell you, the Holy Ghost also blinds. There's an interesting uh, tradition. It's men mentioned by uh, Origen and mentioned by Chrysostom in the 5th century. That this fellow, this Elimus the sorcerer, actually repented of his sins in his blindness. Repented of his sins and became a sincere follower of Christ. Now, we don't know whether that's so or not. Like I said, it's just mentioned, it is mentioned in church history a couple of places. Uh, so it's possible. But, you know, maybe it was that he could not see the S-U-N until he saw the S-O-N, right? <laughs> well, I pray the Lord would take away our blindness, that he'd take away our apathy, and that he would take away our spiritual dullness, and our lack of zeal and give us not only the Holy Spirit and zeal but the Holy Spirit and fire you sure you want the Holy Spirit to sweep through to come through to cleanse to purify don't we need this don't we need the Holy Spirit to come shouldn't there be a holy reverence and a holy fear of God just think of how it would transform the church across America, if there really was, really and truly, a fear, a holy fear of displeasing God, you think it would curtail the things we said? You think, you think we'd watch our mouths a whole lot more? You think we'd watch our attitudes a whole lot more? You think we'd be less prone to, well... Condemn, judge, criticize, even complain. I also know that it would sure prevent people from a lot of the hype and exaggeration and manipulation that we hear. Take away, Lord Jesus. Take away our spiritual dullness. And Lord, we do pray. We do pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would, would come and sweep through us in all of your glory and power. 
Lord, we're certainly not looking for judgment. But Lord, we need a baptism of holy fear. Your church, Lord. We need your holy fear. A holy fear of displeasing you. Lord, help us to remember these passages. I I pray that you'd help us to remember them for the rest of our lives. So that whenever we're tempted, tempted by sin, tempted by compromise, tempted in any way, that we would, Lord, fear in all the right sense of the word. Lord, impart this to us all we ask today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen, amen. Well, amen.